Um, um, the, the, I mean, they have a remarkable uh, set of studies here, a set of parents and children um, and uh, who have gone through practically all of the major historical trends in the American in the 20th century. Uh, these, these are parents who had their first child in 1928-29. In other words, they got pregnant and had a child at the top of the 1920s boom, following World War I and migration and all of those pol political things. And by the time their child was two or three, they were in the midst of the Great Depression. Uh, they then went through and were raising their children during the New okay. Deal, World War II, um, and then the amazing uh, economic boom, uh, the post-war period. So it's just an, um, <laughs> what, quite a uh, group of people who have experienced a group of, uh, a, of uh, major historical events. So I would like to start by asking the uh, authors to elaborate a little bit on what's unique uh, or significant about this study and about this book that's just come out. Glenn, could you start us off? Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know what to do. Okay. Um, after working on um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, what makes uh, the Berkeley study a pathbreaker? To the TV has lost, it says. Yeah. What makes the Berkeley study a pathbreaker? It extends across most of the 1900 years lifespan in a century of extraordinary change. After working on children of the Great Depression, I turned to the Berkeley study, longitudinal study, uh, in 1972, a long time ago, at the Institute of Human Development and discovered an amazing feature. Under the direction of Jean McFarlane, the Berkeley study had followed the parents some 420 and their study child born in 1928-29 across their lives using open-ended interviews to capture their experiences. This intergenerational design is unique and provided an opportunity to study the lives of the 1900 generation of parents. With a book in mind, I started working on drafts of chapters. This continued, believe it or not, into the next century when I invited Rick and Lisa to join me in turning the drafts into polished chapters for the book that has just been published. Our initial two-day workshop on the chapters was a marvelous experience. And I'll now turn it over to the next speaker. Rick, uh, how about you? What do you think is uh, unique about this? Did, did you ask me? I did. Uh, oh, okay, I sorry, I was just <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so I guess for, for me, uh, the, the, the big theme of the book is what's so fascinating. The, the, the issue of how a rapidly changing world affects human lives. I mean, how change leaves people unsettled and disoriented, mm -hmm. what demands that they they adapt to and cope with change, how it alters our lives in uh, profound and unforeseen ways. This seems so especially relevant in our own era of accelerated change, the political discord and social unrest we feel around us, and of course the uncertainty that we've been uh, living in as a result of the pandemic. So often we took inspiration uh, from a quote uh, by an American writer and commentator Walter Lippmann, who was himself a member of the 1900 generation. And in 1914, he wrote these lines. We are unsettled to the very roots of our being. We have changed our environment more quickly than we know how to change ourselves. Um, as I said, this so often served as, a, as an inspiration as we worked on the book. Um, and, and the book really captures a rarely studied generation. Um, this is a generation that Robert Gordon called uh, in, encountering a, a century of revolutionary change. 
their lives were marked by migration, by wartime, by great swings in the economy, uh, and by unimaginable inventions and advances in science and technology. As one person associated with the study said in the 1980s, never again will history equal the rate of change of this period from covered wagons to the moon. So in looking at this particular generation and in being able to uh, track their lives across most of the last century, we have a really special opportunity to, to examine how historical events and periods of social change get expressed in individual and family life. Um, Lisa, uh, you've so often also talked about how they challenge conventional wisdom. Maybe you could say something about that. Muted. You, Lisa? You, you're muted. Oh. <laughs> All right, got it. <laughs> so right. What I found so interesting about this project so many times is the way uh, the ways in which um, conventional wisdom is challenged by these lives. Um, so social commentators today often trace changes in the structure of the economy or family life back to the post-war era or from the 1950s forward. In fact, the 1900 generation demonstrates forms of adaptation in a changing world that are as insightful, if not more insightful, for present circumstances than the 50s or 60s or 70s. For some, it will come as a surprise how the 1900 generation sought loving and equitable marriages and juggled work and family demands across their life course. Quotes from their interviews decades ago often sound like they could have come from young people today, like one woman saying, it was important to me to date as many men as I could to find the right husband. Or another woman who stated, it's a good thing that from the start of our marriage, my husband understood my desire to work or he would not have lasted long. <laughs> well, that's great. I want, to, I want to take us kind of through some of these decades, but for starters, uh, I wonder if uh, one or some of you could uh, talk a little bit about who these people were. These were people who uh, had come through the 20s. Where did they come from? What did they represent? And then we can move on to talk about how they were affected by these next series of events. So who would like to start us off there? I'd, I'd be happy to take it, Stephanie. Um, so uh, as you already noted, these were all couples who had a child, one child born in 1928 or 1929 in Berkeley. And there were about 210 families or 420 parents who were selected in that initial study. Looking backwards, the parents were basically born between 1885 and 1908. Um, and uh, there were interviews and observations and surveys uh, uh, with these uh, children and parents from 1937 to 1947, some intensive periods of observation. Then again in 1969 and again in the early 80s. Um, about 60% were middle class, 40% uh, working class. And the, well, the sample more or less reflects the composition of the kinds of groups who were migrating to California in that time. Uh, about a third were born overseas. Uh, most came from uh, other places, especially central and eastern states of the U.S. Uh, the older members of this generation were, uh, were more likely to be foreign born, and uh, as you might expect, and the younger ones uh, more likely to come from California itself. About 20% uh, grew up on farms. And, uh, but, but so many of their lives are marked by my, migration. Um, and migration is already always the, the result of both pull, push and full, pull forces. Um, some of the most dominant factors that pulled them to California were, well, things you'd expect, assurances of work, uh, better schools, the university, uh, the hospital and, he and healthcare system, uh, fascination with the West, and networks of family members and friends, uh, this sort of chain migration uh, that pulls people across the country. Other factors uh, push them out of the environments where they were. And here especially, we see themes of loss in the lives of these folks, um, uh, the loss of, of their own parents and of family members due to high mortality, uh, to debilitating illnesses from the, from the flu, from 
tuberculosis, from typhoid fever, from pneumonia and sepsis. And it's one thing to feel those push and pull forces, but it's another thing to act on it. And as you'd expect, we, we also imagine them anyway as um, sort of pioneering in, in their own, own ways. Um, the cases are full of references to the kinds of personal characteristics that might leave families open to moving, uh, risk-taking. I'm gonna uh, interrupt, can I interrupt yeah. you here, Rick? Okay, yeah, just, because just to say looking, that, that, that the personal characteristics <laughs> also matter too. Yes. Okay. And go, we'll get into those as we get yep. into the, but I'm looking at the clock and we've got, it's 914, uh, my time. Uh, <laughs> and we've got a lot of uh, things to cover. Uh, so I'm going to kind sure. of rush people through these of a course. little bit. Um, so, but let's turn our attention to the depression decade. Um, can, uh, can you talk a little bit about the patterns of loss and adaptation or, and, and the long-term consequences for family relations? I'll start us off here. So, um, so of course, during the Great Depression, uh, many men, especially, lost jobs or had their hours or salaries cut. And this was hardest on families who were already having trouble making ends meet. Um, it might be because of disadvantaged backgrounds they had or because they were on the younger side of this generation. Those who were were still establishing their careers. So the hit of the Great Depression was um, felt more deeply. And so when families were more financially established prior to the Great Depression, of course, they weathered the storm more easily. However, in rare cases where these well-off families lost men's incomes entirely, the dramatic deprivation and change in social station were partic particularly consequential for marital relations. The loss of jobs or compensation was hard on men who fixed their identities in breadwinning. And women, on the other hand, they could fulfill their identities as caretakers by finding solutions. They stepped up, they took jobs in the widening um, sort of female typical service industry. Um, and they worked in jobs they had worked in prior to getting married. So they sort of seamlessly slid into these jobs. Um, they, it was a lot to work and then come home and do that second shift of domestic work, uh, but they did what they had to do for their families. And when men could be pragmatic and appreciate the work and sacrifices women made, it seemed that marriages were strengthened and they would, the men would say things like, back then money was money. We didn't have time to worry about whether women should work or not. We had a common goal. But when men were resentful of women working, marriages suffered. So Rick, do you wanna say something about the extended family and how that played a role? Sure, so uh, clearly uh, members of this generation were managing family life before many of the government programs that we know today were even developed. Um, and so facing hard times meant that you had to rely on family members and find support wherever you could. Across this depression decade, four out of five families helped or were helped by relatives. And those who needed help really felt shame and embarrassment. And those who gave help often did so with reservation um, and with expectations that weren't expressed and even with resentment. Um, these kinds of tensions were especially strong in the middle class, uh, where uh, more people were spared unemployment and major income loss. On the other hand, working class families were a lot more responsive to uh, relatives who uh, needed help and they accepted burdens even in the most trying circumstances. One thing that we write a lot about in the book is, is also um, the sharing of households, the coming together. Clearly the least preferred way of helping kin, but many had no choice. Uh, over half hosted rel relatives in the 1930s and in the working class, 75% uh, had hosted a parent or a child. And most of those uh, stays with the relatives were, were more than three years. And the, this doubling up of household meant uh, often bringing parents uh, into household and households and grandmothers, especially um, made for, uh, for crowded households. One, one person said, um, grandmother can throw a wet blanket over the group faster than anyone I've ever seen. Uh, but their lives really ache of, of difficult choices in response to hardship. Len, did you want to yes. add anything? Um, I'm going to focus on, uh, on health uh, and uh, the uh, relationship between men and women uh, and uh, the uh, impact of the Great Depression on men had everything to do with what we have come to think of as the uh, breadwinner mandate, uh, where men were 
obligated to support their family. And um, uh, whether the jobs were out there or not. And uh, we have just um, very clear pictures of the agony that men went through. I, I remember a, a visitor of a family encountering a middle-class man who had lost his job and he had tried very hard to um, come up with another one but he what he had his hands head in his hands and he was sitting there and his wife said um, you know I just don't know what I can do to help him and that's kind of a situation that many men went through uh, one talked about um, uh, his mother who kept bugging him about getting a job. And he finally turned around to her and said, I wish you would try and get a job, you know. And the realization that it was very hard to come up with a job when industries had closed down pretty much. Um, I, I think one of the, the big... Uh, issues had to do with coming to terms with change, with a loss of, of position in the community. And um, women who had married down had a particularly difficult time. Uh, and they would hold on to the lifestyle they had before, say, coming in from an upper middle class family to a lower middle class family. Um, and that kind of adher ad adherence to um, uh, a standard that was gone uh, caused a great deal of agony in families and especially in the lives of men, it made their life feel um, much more challenging and hard. Uh, another issue has to do with marital conflict and the, um, the benefits that um, husbands and wives derive from a relationship that was um, supportive despite the hardship. And we have many examples of uh, women stepping forward and saying, you know, a good marriage is not something that you're given, you have to earn it. And that kind of sentiment is uh, commonplace in, in many of the families. And I, I'll close by simply uh, moving you from the depression to old age with a, a 40 couples who, some of them went through hardship and some didn't, but the big interesting uh, observation here is that women seem to come through the depression much better than men. That difference holds forth in the later years as well. Here we have 40 couples and we have husband and wife from the same family. And we find that the women are come through as assertive, resilient, adaptive uh, in their life, in their later years, and men are withdrawn and uh, score very low on agency. So the contrast holds forth across many years and it speaks to a very powerful impact of the Great Depression on the two couples. The timing of this book is so interesting. I imagine everybody in the audience is thinking ahead already of what are the <laughs> differences and similarities in terms yes. of the reactions to the kind of changes that we've been going through recently. Um, but why don't we move to World War II because I know you found some stuff about uh, the effect, impact of World War II on women and men that's different than some of the things that many people assume. So uh, could you talk about that? I think, uh, yes. Um, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and start it off then. Yeah, okay. So the women in World War II, we think about um, the expansion of um, 
women's work in World War II um, with the absence of many women, with, uh, sorry, the absence of many men. Um, and we often think of Rosie the Riveter and um, women expanding into manual labor or wartime industries, but these women, the 1900 generation women, they were in their 30s or 40s. It was actually more the younger unmarried women who filled the roles like Rosie the Riveter. Um, so these women, the 1900 generation women, um, again, went back to uh, jobs that they had done either prior to marriage, maybe also in the Great Depression, um, more female type occupations. Um, one woman said, I did secretarial work during the war. That's what I had done before having kids. I could help a little and earn some money. It felt kind of patriotic. Um, women, again, managed work and domestic responsibilities with the help from family members and federally subsidized daycare. Um, and when the women look back on this work during World War II, um, they're nostalgic. They say things like, I shouldn't say this, but I had a ball. <laughs> um, and that one was referring to the camaraderie she experienced um, going to and from work and working with other women um, and all the money she was able to make. This one in particular doubled her salary. Um, so Glenn, um, do you wanna say something about the men and their work? Sure. Um, the, um, I think w w one uh, of the men uh, uh, gave this observation that during the depression years, uh, it was very hard to find jobs. Uh, and uh, many of us went unemployed for years and years. In the, in the war years, uh, you couldn't, you had very long work days and work weeks. So it was like um, going through an experience where you had no work and then being loaded down with the challenges of a very long work day and very challenging day. Um, and many of these, uh, many of the wives were very concerned about their husbands who uh, had been out of work for quite a while and all of a sudden got employed and they're working very long hours in a day and in a week. Um, and so, you had this real contrast, the double whammy of um, going through an experience with no jobs and very hard to get it, and then very long uh, work days and accelerated work schedules. Uh, and one of the things we know is that um, uh, the health costs, the mortality of this experience for men was very, very significant. And uh, uh, a book recently published uh, pointed to the fact that in 1943, more workers died on the home front than on the war front. Um, and we, we can see it in the shipyards. The shipyards were a very uh, vivid, presentation of these issues because many of the workers came in unskilled and they were put into situations where uh, it was very dangerous and they didn't have the wisdom and the experience to know how to deal with this situation. So many of them um, died uh, in the process of getting a, and supporting their families during the war. So. The contrast between too much, no work and too much work. Uh, and you put it all together and the contrast was enormous for both working class and middle class men in many cases. So I could also say something. Sexual workers, but Rick, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just said some parallels with today's essential yes. workers. Yes, oh, definitely, yeah. 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 Anyway, go on. please Rick. Um, I was just going to add uh, on the parenting front, of course, the fact that households were emptied out meant that kids were unsupervised. <laughs> and so um, what you hear in so many of these transcripts is parents really struggling with the fact that 
Uh, their kids are sort of out there in this bigger, booming, bustling world that really threatens their ability to control what their children are doing and to protect their children from many of the new risks that are that, that are there, um, especially uh, in, in a, a war mobilized Bay Area uh, with many enticements, including young servicemen coming and going. Um, parents especially talk about girls going boy crazy. Um, and it's here this, uh, that we see this steep rise in, um, in both delinquency and misconduct for both boys and girls, but especially for girls. Um, steep hikes in prostitution, sex offenses, and disorderly conduct. So you, you see that parents are really wrestling with how, how to parent kids in a world that's uh, uh, now remarkably different from, from what they knew. Um, can you hear me uh, right now? Okay, good. Yes, um, I think we want to get questions pretty soon, so people should feel free to uh, message me privately with any questions or comments they want to make. Um, but let me uh, uh, ask one uh, question. Uh, you, you guys label this 1900 generation a hinge generation. Um, I'd like you to explain a little bit about what you mean and, um, and how are they a hinge generation. Um, and of course, uh, we'll have to, I, I think the viewers will want to ask ourselves to what extent is the 1900, uh, uh, the, the 2000 generation going to be a hinge generation? What are the parallels uh, and stuff? But talk to us a little bit about how this was a hinge generation and what that meant and what that means to you as researchers. Sure, I, I could get us started on that one. It's a, good, go. it's, it's a good question, <laughs> okay. Stephanie. Um, oh, um, when we talk about a hinge generation, it's a term by uh, the sociologist Leonard, Leonard Cain, um, but we, we use it here because this generation uh, becomes a kind of bridge or a turning point between the past and the present. So their lives are so drastically different from generations before them. And then what we see in them, uh, they, they start to exhibit a set of uh, life patterns and instigate some new life patterns that'll continue to evolve over the century and later generations. And, um, we see that, that in a, a number of topics, but um, really probably perhaps nowhere is this idea of, of this generation as a hinge generation more apparent than in, the, uh, in how they think about children and how they think about the raising of children. So I, I, I could just make a couple quick comments about, about that. Um, that, uh, that these parents become, they sort of at the forefront of a, what becomes a deep cultural turn in parenting, carriers of some new ideas. So they're, they're the first generation of parents to see really revolutionary advances in both the amount and the quality of childcare information. And that's because, the sci because science related to child development emerges in the 1920s, as well as a commitment to doing research on children in order to, to better service uh, uh, child development uh, through family life. They, they have this sense that um, parenthood suddenly is a skill that you have to learn and master. And, um, and they're more conscious of the role of fathers in the development of the child. Um, and then there's this dark side and it's here that they sound so contemporary. Um, and it's that their greater knowledge about child development means that they're more worried and anxious about their children's outcomes and about their own competence as parents. Um, I'll just share one quick quote and then we can move it on. But um, uh, one middle-class mother says, there's been so much propaganda on parents to point out their psychological responsibilities that we're always over anxious, afraid that we'll create fixations. Previously, parents just let children grow up and they hope they turned out for the best. And if they didn't, that was due to the problem of the child. Whereas parents of our generation worry over what we've done wrong. You can see how contemporary that feels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got a question that really um, works right off that and, uh, and is especially interesting contrast with the <laughs> pandemic today um, to talk about uh, the challenges that parents were facing of having someone watch their children um, and they wondered, uh, uh, Elaine Anderson uh, suggested that maybe one of you could speak to the uh, rise of childcare during the, uh, during the war. Uh, 
that was available, that became available for some, the, uh, the Lanham Child Care Centers. Does any of you mm -hmm. want to make a comment about that? Sure. Well, I, I'll just simply um, uh, make the point that, um, that those uh, government organized uh, child care centers were all over Berkeley and made a big difference in the care of children. But right after the war, they all just disappeared. And uh, so- if Well, if I may add difference. one thing, I, uh, my yeah. mother worked in the shipyards during, in Seattle, and yeah. I, she had not had me uh, at the time, but she was so uh, impressed by these uh, childcare centers because they would have the kids in them actually bring home lunch pails uh, uh, for dinners for, for yeah. people. It was remarkable what yeah. could be done. Uh, and then we moved. I, I have to say, I, I've always I love this because we moved down here. My dad went back to school in the GI Bill, and I ended up going into one of these uh, new child center treatment centers that you were um, that you were talking about. My, my, the, we, we even have a little picture of of a newspaper story where they were reporting that my mother was being taught that when I was bad, I should be cuddled instead of spanked and not forced <laughs> to eat my food. So uh, <laughs> these were all the things that were coming on here. I have some other questions. Um, about uh, uh, Pearl Dixra asks, many examples have been given about the lives, how the lives of uh, the 1900 generation were influenced by historical circumstances. Um, but what about the opposite direction, the way in which this generation changed the course of history? You want to weigh in on, I mean, that's a big one, but you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> yeah. Uh... I could say something about the women. So um, there was a great um, deal of educational expansion happening when they um, were in their high school and college years. So, and you know, it's a sample in Berkeley, California, so they had access. Um, so it's a particularly educated um, group, especially the women. And um, so they actually, many of their parents either had family farms or family businesses. And so their parents were working together. There may have been gendered roles um, still, but they saw each other all day long and checked in and knew exactly what each other were doing. Um, and then the, the 1900 generation, um, whether they got extended education or um, a lot of them worked, both men and women worked before they got married. Age at marriage was um, sort of mid twenties, so they had at this, what women call the waiting period between when they finished school. And so they're experiencing these different expectations of how they're gonna um, spend their lives. And um, people often ask, um, why is it that then women, um, when they marry and start having kids, give up the jobs that they had? Um, and didn't they regret that? And, um, but actually we see in their stories that they saw their role as innovating in the home. So they weren't seeing themselves as innovating in um, labor force participation and so on, but they had learned in high school and college about good marriages and, and as Rick was saying, how to take care of um, children. And um, so that's where they were innovating. That's where I think they are changing the ways we understand um, family life and how we raise kids and um, women's roles. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to add to that is, um, when we looked at the relationship between uh, men and women and marriage uh, in this generation, uh, uh, we, we saw the primacy or the importance of sharing in that relationship. And that the significance of it um, is underscored by the fact that husbands and wives were working in different places, were living in different places. And that really underscored the significance of if you're not sharing your experience, then you kind of grow apart. And, they, and many of the um, men and women talk about the stresses of that, um, of trying to, and especially it was very hard in the Great Depression for men to come home and talk about something they really didn't want to talk about because it was so painful in a lot of their experiences. 
apart from the family. But I just wanted to raise that because shared experience really was heightened in this generation because there were there they're living and working in different places and come together. And, and I, I guess I would also just add that what we so often see is that it's women who are driving it. They're demanding new things. That's right. Yeah. Um, That's right. And, um, and so I think it's the women of this generation who are really instigating new kinds of yeah. uh, patterns. Again, again, this is the idea of the hinge that they, that they are, they're creating transformations that will, will further evolve with successive generations, but they're especially demanding new things for their own lives and for, for the men they're attached to. Mm -hmm. Although it was this generation that then dropped uh, out of the workforce to have babies. And at least in my mother's case and some of the research I've done on others who read Betty Friedan, it initially embraced the new family, but um, at about five or 10 years into it, uh, were the first discoverers long before the 60 students of the idea that there was something wrong with this feminine mystique, right? <laughs> so it was kind of a, a back and forth, which leads me to another a question that um, someone else was asking. I, um, uh, Sylvia Honig, I, I'm not good at pronouncing names, so I apologize if I did that last name wrong. But uh, how about any positive, surprising later effects for the children, uh, those who were toddlers in the Great Depression? Uh, we know about, we've heard about some of the bad effects on, on families, on men and women. Uh, uh, but is there, were, were there anything that about the Great Depression that actually developed for at least some children a series of strength or some types of strength? Yeah, I, I'll uh, address that um, because I had a chance to uh, work with both the Oakland um, sample and the Berkeley sample and focus on the children. And I think age uh, is a very important determinant of the experience that uh, children had during the Great Depression. Um, and especially the boys. Um, if you were a young boy, um, the age of say two, three, uh, they, went, they came through the depression years uh, in, a, uh, in many ways, very, very harmed, very much harmed by the experience of living in a family with a father who was depressed and often violent and they, experienced a lot of um, adverse experiences all the way through. Uh, the girls, on the other hand, were protected by their mothers and uh, they came through rather well. So it has a lot to do with that age. The younger kids were, at, were vulnerable and especially the boys. Uh, if you are a teenager, uh, like the Oakland kids and children of the Great Depression, um, the boys came through uh, with flying colors in many ways. They got jobs, they were out of the household, they contributed to the family. Um, and the girls were often brought into the household. And so that, that experience, um, they became a worker in the family and that had um, in some cases uh, restrictive experiences for, for them in terms of uh, getting out and participating in school and, and all of the opportunities in, in adolescence. So I, I simply wanted to make, I had uh, compared these two and was able to come up with this, uh, this report on, on the, the role of age is very important. Um, oh, sorry. Deborah, can, can I? Deborah Phillips oh, writes. Uh, we all we know that your your sample was not an entirely representative in terms of its educational level, its no. race. Uh, no. I don't think that you really dealt with uh, ran much into gay and lesbian uh, couples <laughs> in, in all of this. But um, uh, Deborah Phillips suggests ask what what about the role of race in your longitudinal research? You know, in this course of the COVID pandemic, we're really beginning to see the differential effects of race. So she would like uh, if one of you could talk a little bit about what you found about race in this. Well, I can do I can. it. Um, uh, I think 
when you look at a longitudinal study, you have to ask, what was the community like when the children were recruited to the study? So um, the Berkeley kids um, um, oh, were born uh, in 28, 29, at, at the end of the 20s. And in Berkeley, uh, there, uh, there was a very small black population. I think three or four um, uh, members were, were African-American. Uh, but when you move into the war years, um, the influx of the black population, Mexican population, it, the, the composition of Berkeley ch changed dramatically. So I think of old Berkeley and new Berkeley after um, the, and, and also the Bay Area uh, went through the same kind of changes. So um, I think these samples um, reflect that their time when they were born and growing up during uh, the California years uh, <clears throat> and, and not uh, later on in the, they, we don't have a sample of kids born in the post-war years uh, with all of the influx of people from the from other parts of the country, uh, mm -hmm. from the South, a large number of, a uh, large percentage of the black population came from the South to the, to the shipyard industry and, and changed the composition of the, of the town and the region. Yeah, Rick, and you really you hear parents wrestling with that issue, just how um, marked the shift is over the war years and the composition of the communities and the new, the presence of others. Um, and how the presence of others is changing the fabric of the community and the experience of their kids in school. Mm -hmm. um, another issue of race that does come up around war is, of course, the sudden internment of Japanese families, families that they, who they knew of uh, Japanese kids, their, their, their own children were friends with, suddenly disappear. Yeah. So I think there's a swirling ar around and some pretty serious uh, questions about race and ethnicity and, and, and and again, the, the presence of people who are unlike us and how we respond to that, which is, a, which is clearly an ongoing theme across the century. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Shelley McDermott Wadsworth about um, the impact of government programs. You know, nowadays we often hear about how they make people dependent on self-sufficiency. <laughs> so uh, she asked, uh, based on your analysis of this generation, how do you react to this idea, this widespread idea about uh, government programs? Well, I, I just wanted to put in a plug for the GI Bill because I think it's one of the most uh, insightful and, and marvelous programs in terms of transforming uh, uh, families and, and the country itself. Uh, uh, and the payoff has gone into the second and third generation. Uh, so that was a product of World War II and, and uh, made a difference in families uh, going into mm -hmm. the post-war years. Uh, I, I might also add that um, during the Depression era, again, you feel so acutely how much families are, are struggling um, and how much they have to turn inward to privately to solve their problems. So this is a tension we always hear in our society today about who's responsible for, the, for our welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and again, here you, you just, you, 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 you feel that so strongly in the early lives of these folks, but then who, but yet an appreciation later, I think for how much the programs that emerged out of that era began to protect them and took away some of that struggle and took away some of that shame. Mm -hmm. I know that you don't have any, uh, someone asked about whether there was, a t uh, Liz Pierce asked if there's any attention in the study to same-sex couples and or non-binary people. And I know that that was just not something that was going to come up at that, that era. Um, were there any hints anywhere of um, this, this kind of issue or just was it just something that did not come up in any of the interviews? 
Glenn is okay. Oh, then, really. <laughs> what did you say, Glenn? I'm sorry. No, I, I really don't know of anything. Uh, maybe some of the people who are listening <laughs> would know, but I, I really don't. Uh, I came back. Um, uh, I've, I've been associated with the Institute of Human Development for a good many years. And now it, it's uh, no longer a standing institute. Uh, it's uh, connected to psychology you know, and, uh, in a way that it wasn't before. And uh, I think that um, uh, yeah, I, I really can't... Um, when you work with archives, when you work with archives, you're kind of um, in the world of the person collecting the data. And I really never saw anything uh, of this sort, but I, so I did see, of course, um, a lot of data collected on uh, those who participated in the Second World War in uh, both men and women. and. Um, the changes on the home front. And we try to do as much as we can with that. Um, uh, I found that uh, the Oakland study did not have any data on military service. I had to collect those data later. Um, yeah. Uh, can I, I, um, can I, I've got a quick, we, we got, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I right. was just going to say something again, just quickly about that, the gender question. Yes, there's nothing we encountered in the archives that would reveal that. But I think this goes to Pearl Dykstra's question before about what, um, what do they instigate that, that, that we are in some ways resting our lives on now? I mean, you, Lisa, Lisa writes so much about this in the book as well, just the, how heavily gendered life scripts are. Yeah. And you feel these women trying to pioneer something different mm -hmm. to break free of those, or at least to not break free, but refashion them in some way. And I, I, I think, so there is this question and the struggle in the lives of the women and the men to rethink gender. And I think so, some of the questions now are really an evolution of that mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. struggle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so that, anyway, just a thought. Mm -hmm. I've got an interesting question from Brooke uh, Collison, and she wants to know what would the original researchers think of your work, and what do you envision the future of this study to be for, I assume, future researchers? Well, that's a great question. You, maybe you want to start us? Yeah, well, I, um, this, this study um, is, a, is really on an extraordinary study because G. McFarlane believed in studying intergenerational relationships. And so she followed the parents as well as the children. Um, I think that was enormously valuable. And um, uh, <clears throat> it, um, I think that what I learned from this work is that um, we, we, we are sort of caught in this notion that we need to have a very large sample um, to be representative. And uh, I think that um, we need to rethink this because a lot of important work can be done in smaller samples uh, and focus samples in a comparative structure, for example, comparing uh, regions um, and collecting the rich data that Jean McFarland was specialized specialized in. She really was a premier interviewer, and we found uh, it was a gold mine to to work with. And we went into those materials, and, and we created a code book and and hired coders to get a handle on measures that were not really designed, were not designed by the investigators, basically. Um, for example, the, our, our work on uh, kinship, Jean McFarlane really never asked a question 
about that, but it came up in these interviews in, in uh, profusion, really, and we were able to get a handle on it. So the richness of the interview helps you go back in time and redesign a study, get a handle on something that um, the investigators were not really focused on. Uh, can, can I, I yeah. think we're, let me remind you that uh, we want to get this over with at, um, when we said we would so that people mm -hmm. have other. Uh, so let me just ask um, one quick question from Philip and Carolyn Cowan. And then I'd like to ask a quick question for you or and maybe for other people uh, watching too, to, to think about. Uh, but we talked, you talked a little bit about how marriages adapted or did not adapt, but did you see any interesting change in the view of marriages and couples that came out of this? Can you pinpoint any particular decades or incidents or themes that created a change uh, in, in the views of marriage? Um, yeah. Lisa, what do you think? <laughs> Could you see there's something? A lot. I'm trying to think if there's anything I can return to a couple of things I talked about. I'm trying to think if there's anything different, but I mean, definitely I sort of started on and um, Glenn commented on this um, separation of work and family spheres, like literally in location. Um, and so I think they had these ideas coming into marriage of, you know, this new kind of companionate marriage and that they were going to have these best friends and tell each other everything and life was so <laughs> focused in the home. Um, but then the trend of the, especially the men um, taking these white collar jobs or even working class jobs in factories and things that were far from their homes. So this tension um, and really having to work out how are we going to connect and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, it meant they had to discover how much work that was. And for some of them, um, it went well and for others it didn't. So I think their um, changing notions of how do we communicate, how do we connect and, and know each other. Um, certainly um, they're changing ideas about work for women especially, right? Mm -hmm. So even though they lived, I mean, people ask why did the women um, when they got married and had kids stop working completely for the most part unless they needed to for their family um, and I think partly we can't necessarily blame the women. Like it's the, it right. was the social structure. It was the norm. It would have been completely stigmatized mm -hmm. to go back to work. And yeah. they, that was their world. That's what they knew. Um, and so I think by, um, what happened in the great depression and returning, um, having to work to help families then working in world war II, they didn't necessarily in the interviews come up with a strong direct language and narrative to talk about it, but you could tell they enjoyed working, they enjoyed making money and being able to spend it, um, and were proud of things they accomplished at work. And so whether, you know, society was changing slower than they were maybe in the ideas about if that was appropriate, but by doing it and um, having that experience and passing it along, to their kids, they were changing ideas about um, women's work and what that meant in a family. Well, I think we're, we're approaching the end and I know they want to put some information up about how to get the book. Uh, so let me just make a, a, a final comment, if I may, um, before I thank everybody. Uh, and that is, it seems to me that one one, the one obvious question, but I don't think that they could answer it in two minutes left, is what are the similarities and differences? What can we learn from their reactions to these kind of crises as we go into the, uh, the kind of, as we move out of the lockdown crisis, the recession, uh, what we're going to be doing there? And I would just recommend this book as an excellent um, thought provoking for any of you who are doing contemporary research on the impact on family, on gender, on women's roles, on children, on intergenerational relations to compare what you're finding with what they found. I think that would be, uh, would really enrich mm -hmm. uh, our future conversations going forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's time for me to, to thank uh, our uh, 
um, uh, Glenn and Richard and Lisa for all the work they did uh, on the book and, and for their presence here today and for all of you people who have contributed your attention and your interesting questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. All right, shall we, shall we, Ryan, is there anything else we need to do or shall we sign off to everybody? I think we're great. Thank you all for joining us and spending some of your time with us. Uh, I posted a link for the book in the chat. So if you're interested, please check it out there or you can also find that at your local bookstores as well as more major ones as well. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks.